Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar, uh, which is looking at the resu initial results of a major piece of work that we're carrying out on intergenerational mobility uh, and uh, social uh, mobility. Um, the, uh, the IFS's work goes on after yesterday's excitements. Uh, and actually, this is not, um, not unrelated to the issues associated with social care and inheritance that we uh, were so taken up with in yesterday's uh, announcements. But this is the first output of a longer term uh, piece of research, which we're very grateful to the Economic and Social Research Council for funding. Uh, David Sturrock is going to be speaking to this question, why do wealthy parents have wealthy children? You might think the answer's obvious, but actually there are a lot of interesting issues to untangle here, which it's actually incredibly in important to untangle if we're going to do anything about the intergenerational uh, mobility or lack of mobility in uh, wealth and social outcomes. David will speak for about 25 minutes, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. And you should all have a link to uh, Slido. Uh, so please put your questions in there. And of course, vote for questions in there that you particularly like, because those with the most votes will float to the top, and I'm most likely to see them and therefore ask them of David and indeed his co-author, uh, Peter LaBelle, who you will also see uh, is in attendance here. So with no further ado, I will hand over uh, to, to David. And as I say, in 25 minutes or so, we should be able to take questions via that Slido app. Thanks very much, Paul. I'm going to be talking about our new research on why do wealthy parents have wealthy children? And as Paul said, this is joint work with Peter Lavelle and also Alex Davenport. Uh, this is part of a wider programme of research funded by the Economic and Social Research Council looking at this and related questions. The sorts of questions that motivate this piece of research are those like, are the children of poor parents destined to be poor themselves? And why do rich parents tend to have rich children? These are questions about intergenerational mobility, sometimes called social mobility. That is the questions about how far people's economic and other outcomes are similar to those of their parents, or how far it's possible for those from all different sorts of parental backgrounds to progress to achieve the same um, economic status. And it's often thought to be important because it relates to the concept of equality of opportunity. Social mobility research and policy thinking is often focused on education and on earnings. So, for example, asking what sorts of policies will ensure um, equal progression in education for those from all sorts of different parental backgrounds. But in recent years, there's been increasing focus on wealth in the context of social mobility. Now, one reason for that is that wealth has roughly doubled in size, in fact, more than doubled in size as compared to incomes in the UK over the decades since the 1980s. And there's also been, um, so that is in some sense, uh, meaning that wealth is becoming larger and more important um, as a determinant of people's living standards. There's also been an, an intergenerational element to that, whereby in the last 10 to 15 years or so, Low earnings growth has particularly hit the incomes of those of working age, while at the same time, a lot of the gains in wealth have accrued to those at older ages. I can demonstrate that with a couple of charts, which might be familiar to some of you from previous IFS work. Here, I'm gonna be showing the average levels of income and how that's changed with age for different generations. So here we're showing the average uh, income of those born in the 1950s and how it progressed through their working life, growing as people got older. If we then work through the generations, the 1960s born, the 1970s born, and, and those born in the 1980s, what we see is that, particularly in recent years here in this chart, the most recent ages, 
incomes, uh, income growth has rather stalled. Those um, in each generation don't have any higher incomes on average than those born 10 years before them. And particularly those born in the 1980s haven't seen any higher incomes through their working life so far than those born in the 1970s. If I now move that chart up to the left and then contrast this with a second chart on the right, which is now showing for the equivalent generations, the average level of wealth of the parents of these young people, we see a different sort of picture. So here I'm showing average wealth of parents by the, the ages of those parents. And we see that while in each of these generations, there's a bit of up and down caused by house prices going up before the financial crisis and then falling before rising again in recent years, we see that comparing generations to, uh, to the ones before them, subsequent generations of parents are holding more wealth. And what that has done is to raise questions about uh, how far people's living standards are dependent upon who their parents are, and in particular, the role of parental wealth um, in potentially driving outcomes for younger people. So in this context, we think that we should look at wealth when thinking about social mobility for three particular reasons. First of all, um, wealth captures intergenerational financial transfers and the returns to wealth insofar as those are saved. And in that sense, wealth might be a more holistic measure of young people's economic resources because it captures these things which aren't typically included in regular earnings and incomes measures. Secondly, we might think that wealth is a kind of an important outcome in and of itself. It might, for example, bring economic security. And thirdly, thinking about this from the parent side now, wealth might be a resource that parents are able to use to transfer advantages to their children. Given this context and this motivation, the focus of our research is on two questions. Firstly, we want to ask how much does your wealth depend on how wealthy your parents are? And what we're going to do is to examine the wealth of those who were born in the 1970s and 1980s in the UK when they were in their 30s and look at how that relates to the wealth of their parents. Once we've established how much wealth persists from parents to children, we then want to ask what channels are associated with the intergenerational persistence of wealth. We'll be looking at earnings, at saving, at rates of return on wealth, and at whether people have partners and how much those partners earn. And we'll be looking at whether those things look to vary between those with less and more wealthy parents and therefore might explain some of the persistence of wealth that we see across generations. The headline finding of our research is that those with the wealthiest fifth of parents hold six times more wealth than those with the uh, parents in the poorest fifth when they were in their 30s. Here what I'm doing is showing average levels of wealth of these children split by where their parents were in the wealth distribution amongst their generation. So for example, on the left hand side here, I'm showing that amongst those whose parents were in the poorest fifth amongst their generation, average wealth level of their children is about £18,000. Those, as, as we move up and look at progressively wealthier parents, we see that their children hold an average higher levels of wealth. And amongst those whose parents were in the wealthiest fifth in their generation, average holdings of wealth of the children are over £100,000. So what's this net wealth measure made up of? Well, on the asset side, the bulk of it is housing wealth. We also have what we're calling safe financial assets. That's current accounts and savings accounts and so on. And then we have risky financial assets, which is things like stocks and shares. Now, one thing that's notable is the relatively high proportion of wealth that's held as risky financial assets for those who have the richest fifth of parents. And then turning to the uh, debt side of the equation, the bulk of uh, debts is mortgage debt. We also have unsecured debts, which are things like loans, credit card debts. And when we subtract those debts from the asset side, then we're left over with our net wealth. 
And one way of summarizing this relationship between parents' wealth and the wealth of their children is that for each 10% increase on, in parental wealth, on average, children are holding 4% more wealth. Now, another way of looking at the relationship between uh, parents' wealth and children's wealth is to look at the rank, the position of parents in the distribution of wealth for their generation and how that relates to where children sit in the, in the distribution amongst their generation. So what we do is to rank all of our parents from those with the least wealth in their generation to those with the most wealth and put them into a hundred different groups. And then we do the same for the children, ranking them in their generation in terms of wealth. And then here I'm showing the average rank of children in their generation and how that varies with the wealth rank of parents. And what we see is that as we look at parents who are progressively further up the distribution, the average position of their children is rising in a fairly steady way. Now, this line here, giving the, the, the slope of that relationship, is a kind of a measure of how closely children's wealth rank follows that of their parents. So here, the slope of that line is 0.37, which we say means that for every percentile rank that parents uh, move up, on average, their children are moving up 0.37 ranks in the wealth distribution in their generation. So with these two uh, measures, we have these two measures of intergenerational wealth mobility in the UK. As I said, 10% higher parents' wealth is associated with about 4% more child wealth. And parents who are one percentile rank higher up in the wealth distribution in their generation have children that, who are on average 0.37 ranks higher up in the distribution in their generation. And these are measures which have been calculated in a few other countries and then we can compare across countries. And on these measures, the UK has a similar level of wealth mobility to the United States, a country which is often thought to have low levels of social mobility. And wealth persistence is higher, in other words, mobility is lower than in Scandinavian countries. Now, these measures are telling us about how children's position in the wealth distribution changes on average with their parents' wealth. But we might care particularly about whether parental wealth matters for, say, escaping the bottom of the wealth distribution or making it all the way to the top. And what we find, and what I'm going to show you in this chart, is that having wealthy parents seems to be particularly important for getting to the top of the wealth distribution. So in this bar on the left-hand side, I'm showing for those children whose parents were in the least wealthy fifth in their generation, the proportion who themselves are in the least wealthy fifth, uh, second uh, least wealthy fifth, and so on, all the way up to the wealthiest fifth in their generation. So for example, amongst those with the poorest parents, 30% were in the least wealthy fifth themselves as an adult, and about 5% were in the wealthiest fifth. If we look at those who have wealthier parents, then, of course, as I've just told you, they're uh, consi consistent with what I've just told you. Their children tend to be further up the wealth distribution. But one thing I want to highlight in particular is the fact that if we look at the proportion who make it into the top of the wealth distribution, um, that's substantially higher for those who have the wealthiest parents. So, for example, about three times higher for those whose parents are in the wealthiest fifth as compared to those with more average levels of parental wealth. But by contrast, whether or not you're in the bottom of the distribution um, is, is roughly equally likely for whether you have the very richest parents or parents with more average wealth. And why, why might that be? Well, it could be that because of the particularly high amounts of wealth required to make it into the top of the wealth distribution, having wealthy parents who are able to make financial transfers uh, might be uh, kind of necessary to make it uh, that far up the distribution. So in just in summary then to our answers to the first question, are that the persistence of wealth across generations in the UK is high 
high compared to the other countries where it's been measured. And that wealthy parents seem to be particularly important for getting to the top of the wealth distribution. Now we want to turn to the second question of what channels are associated with the persistence of wealth across generations. That's trying to get at why it is that wealthier parents have wealthy children. First of all, I think here it's useful to set out a bit of a, a schematic diagram that will help us think through the different channels that could be at work. So firstly, and most straightforwardly, uh, there might be a, a link between parents' wealth and the wealth of their children, because parents who have more, more wealth might transfer more wealth directly to their children. We're looking at uh, children and parents at an age where the, the parents are generally still alive, won't have passed on inheritances, but they might have made gifts while still alive to their, to their children. Unfortunately, those aren't recorded in our data, but I will say something about them later on. Secondly, it's possible that those with wealthier parents tend to have high levels of education and earnings and that that helps them to build up more wealth. And it might help because those with higher earnings might be able to save more. Uh, they might also be willing to invest in potentially riskier, higher return assets that might mean that their wealth grows faster. It also might be the case that those who are more educated or who earn more are more likely to have a partner or to have a partner who earns more, and that might help them to build up more wealth too. Now, these things could be associated with the child's earnings, but it might also be that if we take two different children with the same level of earnings, the one that has the wealthier parent might tend to, for example, save more or invest in higher return assets. And that possibility is depicted by this third arrow here. Now, these orange arrows are intended to depict the sorts of associations that would drive a relationship between parents and children's wealth and ones where it could be the case that parents' wealth actually has an effect on child wealth. But we also know from a lot of other research that uh, parents who have higher earnings tend to have higher earning children, and that those who earn more tend to build up more wealth. And what that means is that even if none of these channels uh, depicted in orange were relevant, nothing was going on there, we were, might still, or we would still expect there to be a relationship between parents and children's wealth driven by the similarity in their earnings. And I'm indicating that possibility here with these, uh, this box and, and dotted lines. So what we want to ask first of all is how much of the persistence in wealth is just a kind of byproduct of the persistence of earnings and education from one generation to the next. So that is how important are the channels feeding through these blue arrows. So one way of thinking about this is that if it were the case that wealth persistence was just a byproduct of earnings persistence in this way, then we would expect to see the same relationship in terms between parents' earnings rank and their children's earnings ranking as we saw for wealth. So we can look at that here. So in this chart, I'm showing now, similarly to what I did for wealth, but now for earnings, by those parents of different rankings by er in terms of the earnings distribution, what is the average position of their children in the earnings distribution in their generation? We see that there's a positive relationship here. Higher earning parents have higher earning children, but the degree of association is weaker than we saw for wealth. So here, the slope of this red line is flatter than the slope for this yellow line that we saw for wealth. Further, if we strip out the differences in wealth uh, of parents and children that are in some sense accounted for by the differences in the earnings of those with more and less wealth, um, then what we see is that uh, once we've done that, we can account for about 50% of the persistence in wealth across generations. What that means is that about half of the persistence in wealth 
is still to be accounted for and is potentially explained by some of these other channels uh, in the, as shown by the orange arrows. So now we're going to turn to examine the evidence on those and see whether they might be playing a role in the persistence of wealth from one generation to the next. So first of all, I'm going to think about whether parents' wealth is associated with their children's education and earnings, and importantly, whether those with wealthy, wealthier parents are earning more, even when we compare those with parents of similar levels of earnings. So here I'm showing the average level of earnings for those with less and more wealthy parents. And we see, for example, that those whose parents are in the wealthiest fifth earn on average about £30,000. That's more than double the just under £15,000 earned on average by those with the least wealthy parents. But as I've just pointed out, we know that those who have higher earning parents tend to be higher earners. So how much of this is just um, a, a sort of explained by the fact that higher earning parents have higher earning children and how much of it might actually be something to do with wealth itself. So once we control for parents' earnings and strip out the differences attributable to that, as shown in this green line, the differences between those with richer and poorer parents are smaller, but they are still substantial. In particular, we can see that uh, the gap between those with parents in the wealthiest fifth and the second wealthiest fifth is about £6,000 in earnings on average. And that gap is actually particularly driven by those with the very wealthiest parents being um, uh, significantly more likely to have particularly high earning jobs. So this suggests that there, there might be some sort of role for parental wealth um, when it comes to children's earnings. But now we want to turn and ask, well, even for children who have a certain level of earnings, is it the case that those with wealthier parents tend to build up more wealth from that given level of earnings? So here I'm showing the average savings rates of those with different levels of parental wealth. What we find is that children who have wealthier parents tend to save a higher proportion of their, as compared to their earnings. And that's uh, really quite a substantial gap, varying from about 3% savings rate for those of the parents' parents up to 12% at the top. But now again, we know that those with wealthier parents tend to be higher earning children, and that those who earn more tend to save a larger share of their earnings. So is that what's driving this pattern? Well, actually, once we strip out the differences that are explained by the fact that wealthier parents have higher earning children, then we still see substantial differences in savings rates. So that is to say that those with wealthy, wealthy parents save more even for a given level of earnings. And these differences are substantial enough that they could drive quite different accumulation of wealth if sustained over a few years. But what about what the children do with those, uh, that wealth that they're saving and accumulating? Do those with wealthy parents tend to build up uh, more wealth by, say, investing in higher return assets? We find that those with wealthier parents are more likely to be holding risky and potentially higher return assets. Here, for example, I'm showing the proportion of young people who hold some risky financial assets. That's things like stocks and shares. And that's higher, particularly for those who have parents in the wealthiest fifth. And again, we want to strip out any of the differences here that are driven by the differences in earnings between those with less and more wealthy parents. And once we've done that, we still see a slightly higher rate of um, owning of risky assets for those with the wealthiest parents. Now, while the amounts of wealth held as risky assets aren't really uh, that great for those in their 30s, and so this can't really drive big um, gaps in the wealth between those of rich and poor parents, it is something which could tend to drive um, inequalities going forwards. We see some differences in terms of debt holding 
uh, whereby those with poorer parents are more likely to be holding some debt. But again, the differences here aren't going to be um, a big factor in driving the patterns that we see in wealth overall. However, we do see particularly big differences in home ownership rates. Uh, here, for example, we're showing that with those with the poorest fifth of parents, about 25% of them were homeowners when they were in their 30s, compared to 60% or more of those with the parents in the top half of the distribution. And these differences are partly explained by those with poorer parents being lower earners, but even once we've stripped that out, there's still a substantial gap in home ownership rates between those with less and more wealthy parents. Now, because um, uh, housing wealth is a particularly important component of, of overall wealth, I'm going to focus in on this a bit more. Here, I'm showing how it is that the home ownership rates of those with different levels of parental wealth start to diverge as children move through their 20s. So here I'm showing the home ownership rates for those with parents in the bottom third by wealth, middle third and top third. And we see that those with higher levels of parental wealth start to pull away uh, once their children are getting into their late 20s. And again, even once we've accounted for the differences in the earnings of the children in these different groups, there's still substantial differences in the home ownership rate by age 30. Those with parents in the richest third having a home ownership rate 17 percentage points higher than those with children uh, with the poorest third of parents, even when comparing those with similar levels of earnings. And at the time that they buy their parents, that buy their, their um, homes, those with richer parents have more expensive houses as compared to their earnings, and they buy these with larger deposits. So here I'm showing in the red line, the average price to earnings ratio at the time that people buy a house, that's the value of the house as a multiple of their annual earnings. And while well, it's about three times for those with relatively uh, poorer parents, it rises up to five times annual earnings for those with the richest fifth of parents. In this green line, I'm also showing that when they buy their home, those with richer parents have a lower loan to value ratio. That is, the value of their mortgage is smaller as a percentage of the value of the house. So that means that they're paying for more of that house upfront. And that's presumably how they're able to buy these larger houses compared to their earnings. And that itself is also suggestive of these younger people with richer parents either having built up more savings themselves, which is a possibility as, as we've seen, but it could also be that they're getting assistance from parents in terms of financial transfers when they buy their homes. And we know from other data sets that financial transfers are common at the time of home ownership. But the final point here is that while uh, perhaps transfers at the time of home ownership, home ownership are uh, important in driving wealth gaps, it doesn't seem that subsequent returns on housing wealth are really a big factor in driving uh, the expansion of wealth gaps between those with richer and poorer parents. So here I'm showing the average capital gain on housing, that is the increase in the value of the house, um, shown for those with different levels of parental wealth. And we see that those with richer parents are getting larger uh, capital gains on their home, so a larger return to that wealth. But when we express that capital gain in as a percentage of their net wealth, so that's telling us whether this is driving differences in the rate of, of growth of wealth across uh, these different groups, we see that there isn't really an obvious pattern between those with richer and poorer parents. Well, how is that? Well, while those uh, with less wealthy parents are seeing smaller capital gains because they're less likely to be homeowners and they have smaller homes, because they tend to buy them with larger mortgages, these capital gains as a percentage of their wealth, of their net wealth, um, are uh, kind of, of, of a similar level to those richer parents. So finally, we look at whether those with wealthier parents are more likely to have 
partners and whether those partners have higher earnings. We see that uh, there's a similar rate in terms of those who have partners across the, the distribution. It is true that those with higher earning, uh, with wealthier parents, tend to have higher earning partners. However, this is uh, almost all accounted for by the earnings of the child themselves. So in other words, if we take two people with the same level of earnings, it's not the case that the person with richer parents is more likely to have a higher earning partner. So this doesn't seem to be something which is driving additional persistence in wealth. So just to conclude then, we've seen that the intergenerational persistence in wealth is higher than for earnings and higher compared to the other countries where it's been measured. About half of that persistence in wealth from parents to children is not accounted for by the persistence of earnings and education. So why is it that wealth is more persistent across generations than earnings? Well, parental wealth is associated with child's earnings beyond that which is accounted for by the parents' education and earnings. The children of wealthier parents tend to save more, even for a given level of earnings. And it also looks like direct transfers of wealth are likely to have a role. This is consistent with the children of wealthier parents getting on the housing ladder sooner and buying more expensive houses with smaller mortgages. And finally, greater holding of risky financial assets um, probably plays only a modest role uh, in driving the wealth gaps that we see so far that could become important over time. So what does this all mean for policy? Well, firstly, policies that would improve education and progression and um, for those from lower education and lower income parental backgrounds would likely uh, increase intergenerational wealth mobility. However, they would not by themselves equalize wealth outcomes between those with more and less wealthy parents. And that's because a significant amount of the inequalities in wealth that we see by parental backgrounds appear to be due to other channels through which parents transmit advantages to their children. And so making further progress and wealth mobility would mean tackling some of those inequalities through those channels as well. Thanks very much. I'm going to stop there for now. Oh, thanks so much, David. That was uh, absolutely um, fascinating, if um, somewhat depressing at times with respect to the, um, the importance of um, parental wealth. I thought some of that was very, uh, very striking. This, uh, this, this greater relationship, or the even greater social immobility than that which we usually measure when we look at incomes. Uh, and I, I think we'll call particularly that, uh, that very that almost needing to have rich parents if you've got any chance of getting to the top of the distribution yourself. I so suppose one thing I'd like before I move to the questions on Slido, to what extent have you thought about, I mean, you're obviously looking at young adults at this point. I mean, have you, are you able to speculate at all as to how this might um, play out if you were looking over longer periods of people's lives? So we don't have um, the data of this sort, which links parents directly to children at older ages. But what we have thought about in previous bits of research and perhaps the kind of most obvious uh, next thing that could affect young people's wealth in this way is inheritances that they receive from their parents. And those are likely to be received towards the end of working life for these generations. And a previous bit of research that we did at the IFS, we found that we think that inheritances are going to play quite a big role in driving persistence of wealth and lifetime incomes across generations again. So I think that going forward, that's probably the, the kind of the next big piece in the puzzle that would tend to reinforce these trends even further. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, and, and I presume also given the, uh, as, as a number of people have sort of suggested, um, as, as returns on wealth appear to be higher than earnings growth over time, presumably, you know, even if you're starting with even modestly more wealth in your 30s, then the chances of the difference between you and other people growing over time is quite large. Yeah, I think so. That's, that's certainly a kind of a, a story of what we've seen in, in recent times. And I guess one of the main 
examples that people point to is, is housing wealth, where it seems that if you have got onto the housing ladder earlier, that has you know, been probably beneficial for your wealth, um, at least on average. There, I suppose there is a big uncertainty about what's going to happen to rates of return going forward. Um, this has probably been predicted before, but economists tend to think that um, rates of return going forward are not going to be as high as they've been in the past. So that might mean that um, that sort of dynamic that we've expressed isn't going to play out in the same way. On the other hand, what that does mean is that it's potentially more difficult for younger generations who haven't yet uh, built up wealth to build up more wealth. Um, whereas perhaps the older generations who kind of already seen the benefits of the high rates of return in recent years um, will kind of um, still be left in with, with relatively higher wealth. There's a, there's a question here, which I think is quite interesting. And I, I don't know whether you've got any data of this on this. It's essentially asking whether part of the reason that um, children of poorer parents have lower savings is that there's sort of reverse intergenerational uh, transfers. I mean, do you have any information on whether children are supporting parents in any of this? That's not something that we looked at. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's something that we that we could look at in the data that we have. Um, if that is something which, you know, other research has shown does take place, there's these, of course, the, the flows can, can go in both directions. Um, but I have to say, I don't know um, whether that whether that could be could be driving the pattern that we're seeing, but that yeah, that is something that might be uh, worth looking into a bit more in the future. Um, so uh, and again, I rather suspect there's a series of questions here that you can't answer because of the um, the data. Um, do, do you know anything about life satisfaction? Um, which I think is really an interesting, actually a really interesting question about the um, about the extent to which any of this additional um, wealth that uh, richer children have leads to them being happier. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I, I'm afraid, yeah, that's not something that we've that we've looked into thus far. Uh, I mean, that there is kind of research looking at um, the importance of kind of wealth for more broad um, kind of sense of security and, and things like that. And that could be part of the importance of wealth. So kind of beyond what it is able to uh, just buy you. Um, but that's, yeah, that's not something I'm afraid we've, we've looked at in this particular piece of research. Do, do you have, um, uh, there's some measures of this in understanding society out there. Yeah. So I think that's something that we could, we could try and, um, have a think about we could have a look at that so whether you know those who who have say a similar level of earnings but a richer parents mm -hmm. uh, tend to be more uh, report more life satisfaction or perhaps they're less uh, worried about economic insecurity mm -hmm. and things like that so that would be a really interesting thing for us to look at actually and of course there's the kind of idea that that kind of um that knowledge of the the potential for parental support might kind of in turn impact then your behaviors if you feel perhaps more secure you're more willing to take risks um maybe uh, we i'm afraid again we don't have direct data on this but maybe that sort of thing could be driving the gaps that we see in terms of the early earnings of those with work wealthier parents maybe they're more able or willing to kind of take a risk in their career and therefore kind of maybe wait out for the really top jobs um, or start their own business or something like that. And these are the sorts of things that we want to look into right. a bit more as this whole, as the whole program of research develops. Now, I think that'll be, um, I mean, well, let, let's take that away. I mean, given, given we've got that information in, in understanding the society and given what you've done on, um, on wealth here, it strike me as a really interesting question. It strike me as being well worthwhile looking at um, how, uh, parental income and wealth relates to children's um, sense of, uh, of well-being. Um, the next, I, mean, I really am pretty much going down the list here. There's a question about grandparents' um, position, which I guess uh, and its relationship to um, uh, grandchildren's um, wealth. Uh, 
I guess we don't really have the data to look more than one generation apart. Is that is that true? We don't in this data set. Um, in a bit of research that we've got coming up using a different data set, the Wealth and Assets Survey, we, we there is some new data which is going to be available where people are asked about who they've received financial transfers from. And so there we'll be able to look at um, whether people are receiving money from their grandparents, um, how important that is, whether it's taking place, at, for example, the time where they buy a house. Um, and so we will be able to dig into that a bit more. We're not able to compare the wealth of grandparents to the wealth of children in the same way that we've done in this piece of research, but we can start to shed a bit of light on this. Uh, there is actually a bit of, of prior research uh, in the kind of social mobility literature that, that speaks to this, in that it's, it's been found that actually if you look over multiple generations, then you actually see that even once you kind of accounted for your parents' position, your grandparents' position is still kind of relevant to where you end up. So that kind of speaks to their either being maybe a direct role for grandparents, as, as some people have suggested, or perhaps there are kind of, um, kind of deeper, longer term factors at play, which don't always show up in, say, your parents' earnings or wealth, but nevertheless are kind of being passed on uh, from one generation to the next. Yeah, I think that's uh, some of that work is, um, is fascinating. Some people have used very clever ways of looking down multiple generations, haven't they? I mean, um, for example, following surnames down. Yeah, so that was one kind of way of trying to piece together over a much longer time period where we didn't have the sorts of um, modern data sets that we have and, and look at the persistence of wealth. And in that case, by using people who had particularly rare surnames and therefore you could kind of know with quite a likelihood that they were going to be related to each other. Um, and so follow, follow the persistence of wealth over, um, over multiple generations. Yeah, uh, sadly, we can't go back and collect data retrospectively from those who died a century ago. But, yeah. uh, uh, but no, that's, that's, that's very exciting um, stuff. And it's a question here, Darren, what, what, what do you do about divorced parents? I mean, in, in terms of the wealth that you're looking at, do you, do you sum the two? And also, do you, are you able, have you got enough in your sample to be able to say anything about whether divorce in itself has an impact on children's uh, wealth? Yeah, great question. So this is one of these um, slightly, slightly tricky questions for us when it comes to thinking about the data and who is actually someone's parents that can, you know, can change over time. So what we do is that in the data, if we observe you living with your biological parents, then they, their wealth gets counted. So even if those parents then separate and um, are living separately, we're going to add together the wealth of those divorced parents. Um, in certain situations where, for example, um, at the outset of the data, so, uh, only one parent was present in the household, or maybe there was a step parent present in the child's household, then we use the uh, wealth of the step parents under, kind of, under the assumption that, you know, if they were there throughout the, ch the child's younger years, and there wasn't a biological parent there, then they're probably the, uh, the person who's relevant in that in that situation. Um, in terms of the sample size, whether we could look at the effect of divorce and things like that, um, I'm not sure. I think it's, it, it could be something that we could examine if we might be struggling a bit uh, for, um, for sample size there. But I think that something which is, is kind of interesting is, would be to kind of look at uh, those sorts of differences. We also have in our data, uh, sometimes we have um, siblings who are observed and then go their separate ways in later life and examining why for example two people who had a similar uh, start in terms of their parental household then ended up uh, diverging or not would be another really interesting thing that we could look at with the data that we've assembled here. There's a couple of sort of normative questions here really about what's fair and what's um what's acceptable? I mean, you, uh, I, I don't know whether you feel you can um, give any real response uh, to these questions. There's one about, um, you know, given that your parents are, it's just random, 
does that tell us anything about the appropriate level of inheritance tax in a fair society? And another question about what level of wealth immobility um, is acceptable, given that it could never be fully equalised and we presumably couldn't, shouldn't try um, to equalise it. I think these are, these are some of the most complex and difficult yeah. questions in uh, philosophy, let alone, um, uh, let alone economics. I mean, one, one thing uh, I will say is that we, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, we have the launch of the first papers from our uh, big review of inequalities being led by Angus Deaton. And uh, the first of those papers is actually specifically about the, um, the, the, the ethical issues and thinking about what is wrong with um, inequality. So do, and, and, and that's gonna be presented by Deborah Satz, who is one of the world's leading uh, philosophers of justice. Um, and that, uh, that event, I think, is on something like the 20, uh, 23rd of September. So if, if you're interested, if people who are watching this are interested more in the, um, in the ethics of all of this, uh, then we will, we will actually have a proper philosopher to answer some of those questions uh, in a couple of weeks' time. But in the absence of a proper philosopher, <laughs> David, <laughs> any thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I think that a philosopher might say that you know, how, you, how you regard these, these differences kind of depends on why they are arising. And that's maybe where our research can kind of feed in and help. So to take a couple of examples... If um, a lot of the differences in wealth are just about differences in how much people choose to save, then there's an argument that, well, that's just a decision about whether you spend the money now or you spend it later. And that's not a particularly a kind of, it's not really more of an injustice that some people choose to spend their money later in their life. Um, on uh, to take another example, and uh, perhaps it might be thought that, you know, transfers, direct transfers of wealth from parents are perhaps more, you know, obviously just a matter of the luck of who your parents are. Then there's more tricky ones kind of uh, in between where um, we think about, for example, differences in people's earnings. How much are they something which, uh, you know, is kind of their own doing that they in some sense deserve. But if it's so closely or, 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 or somewhat related to their parents' background, potentially, uh, explained by that, then is that also something which was um, not so under their control um, and therefore, you know, a, another inequality which perhaps um, is, is not fair in some sense. So I think we can shed some light on, on why and what the different drivers are and that combined with all these other ethical judgments might allow you to, to say something about, about what should be done. Uh Right. Um, uh, as I say, I mean, that, I think that was really helpful. I mean, I think the other thing that's really interesting is we also have quite a lot of um, information on people's attitudes uh, to this. Um, and uh, certainly when it comes to the state doing anything about it, um, people aren't very keen on redistribution of, of wealth. Certainly inheritance tax is very unpopular. Uh, and actually another thing we're going to be launching on the 23rd um, September alongside the, um, uh, this work of Deborah Satz is some work um, by uh, Stephanie Stancheva at Harvard, who is an economist who looks really very much at uh, people's attitudes to redistribution, as well as work from Bobby Duffy at King's College London with a new survey of attitudes. I think one of the things very striking about both those pieces of work is, is first that there's a, there's a lot of disagreement among the population about how concerned they are about inequalities of one kind or another. Uh, uh, and uh, a, uh, even among people who say they are concerned about inequalities, a, a, a real reluctance to um, move from that view to a view that the state should really be doing something substantial about it. So again, um, do tune in on the 23rd if you want more on that I think incredibly important and uh, an interesting um, set of issues. Um, lots more questions and not much um, time. There's a couple of questions about debt. 
Um, and I know you've done some work in the past about debt, David. I mean, there's one, one question here is about, um, uh, you know, is it appropriate to net off debt, given that's often used by the wealthy to leverage high return financial um, investments? But, and a sort of opposite type of question, in a sense, is about debt as a barrier to wealth um, accumulation. I mean, how, how do you handle debt in this? And do you have any thoughts about how debt fits into this? So as we, as we set out, so we do net off people's debts, their mortgages, or their unsecured debts from their other assets. I think that's the appropriate thing to do in the sense that um, when you're thinking about wealth as you know, resources that people could use in the future, debts have got to be paid back. And so that is um, something which subtracts from your spending possibilities in the future. That issue of, of people um, taking on more leverage um, using debt is an interesting one. I mean, there, one thing, a, a kind of preliminary conclusion that surprised us, I think, a bit was that actually when it came to the point of home ownership, those with wealthier parents were actually taking on less debt as a percentage of the home value than those with poorer parents. Now, in some ways, um, that once you think a bit more about it, makes some sense. If those with wealthier parents were able to get more cash from their parents up front, then that's going to allow them to, to pay for a bigger mortgage. And they might want to, to, to uh, sorry, pay for a bigger house without needing to borrow uh, through a mortgage. And that might also allow them to buy a bigger house than they would otherwise be able to do because... And they can get that money from their parents rather than having to borrow it from the bank. And what that would tend to mean is that then, um, the, as we showed, even though richer people are more likely to be homeowners, in terms of the return that then accrues to that wealth thereafter, uh, because they're not as leveraged as, as this question is asking about, um, they don't get uh, th that, that kind of, reduces the return that they get and sort of brings it down in percentage terms to be more similar to those with lower levels of parental wealth. Um, but I think that this, that whole area of, of leverage and of taking on risk and of also how it is that people um, use financial transfers to get onto the housing ladder is one that we're going to be thinking about a lot more going forward um, and looking in more detail at in the next stages of this bit of research. Yeah, that is um, that is that is fascinating. I think the whole, um, I mean, the, ho the whole element of this actually, which is directly related to um, home ownership, I found um, particularly interesting. And that uh, you know that very big difference in home ownership rates between uh, those with wealthier and less wealthy parents. Um, is, 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 is quite remarkable. And, but you also show even when you control for children's earnings, there's still a very big gap, isn't there, in home ownership rates? Yeah, that's right. So it's not just that, you know, people with richer parents can earn uh, earning more and, you know, you need to have earnings in order to be able to go to the bank and say, give me a loan to buy a house and you need earnings to save up for that deposit. Even once you've taken that into account, and the, the thought is here, compare two people who have the same earnings, the one has richer parents than the other, then the one with richer parents is more likely to have become a homeowner. And there's quite a substantial gap that we see opening up uh, amongst those in their late 20s. And, and that, I suppose, is, is, is one area where there's been some recent government policy action that kind of help to buy type schemes that are aimed not just at equalizing access across those of richer and poorer parents, but at helping younger people who are in general struggling to, to save up the deposits that they need um, to, to buy a home. Um, and again, um, that's something that, so it's an area where we can ask, um, how do these government policies affect intergenerational wealth mobility? Maybe it's a good thing to uh, to try and expand access to home ownership in this way, or perhaps those who are able to take advantage of it are those um, or who are willing to take advantage of it are those with wealthier parents in the first place.
Um, so again, this is this is one for the, the next um, part of this research program. Um, so we'll be uh, there'll be more to come uh, in this area in the future. Brilliant. Um, so we've really not got much more time. I'm going to finish off with one question, which I think is really interesting. We often focus a lot on getting to the top of the distribution. And there's a question here really asking, what do we know about um, getting from the bottom to the middle of the distribution, which in some ways may be even more important. Um, it's, it's all very well to worry about people getting to the top, but um, possibly more important from the point of view of social mobility is can those at the bottom um, claw their way up to the middle? Yeah, I think that's um, it's a great question. Um, I mean, we find that, you know, there, again, it is the case that those with, with poorer parents are more likely to, to be kind of, um, at the bottom of the wealth distribution. So having wealthier parents does matter for getting even out of those uh, particularly low levels um, of wealth. Um, we've not looked at sort of the particular uh, drivers of that movement away from, from the bottom to the middle. Um, I don't know if um, Peter's got anything to add. On that well, one. just I guess just to say in, in the report, so uh, when we, we talk about these correlations in, in, in um, David's uh, uh, presentation, um, we summarize these things in a single number. What David also showed was the full transition matrix of people from one web wealth quintile to another. And what that showed was that kind of wealth was definitely kind of stickier at the top uh, than at the bottom. So there is more movement in the middle than there is at the top. It's quite difficult for someone from lower down the distribution to get into the very top of the wealth distribution, but uh, lower down um, uh, within the wealth distribution, there is a bit more mobility. So we, we discussed that a bit more in, 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 in the report. Um, I suppose one final point there is, and, and just sort of pointing out something which is missing from our research right at the end, um, is, is, of course, is, there are other sorts of wealth, uh, like pension wealth, and, and that is, is very different in some ways. But in recent years, that's one of the, the parts of wealth which has been kind of uh, increasing the most for younger people and potentially is one where those um, sort of more, gen it's more generally accessible and people are being automatically enrolled into their pensions might be more important for those further down the distribution. Uh, so again, I, I raised that, but without us having been able to look at it in this report, as pension wealth isn't measured in this data set. But again, I think another important one to think about going forward is um, in the past, we probably thought about housing wealth as being very important. Maybe uh, for some wealth progression is going to be more reliant on, on their pension. But that also then raises, raises further issues too. Well, look, it's now two minutes to 10. I think, um, I think that's been an absolutely fantastic session. Dave, you've covered an enormous um, range of questions there, but as well as uh, the fantastic uh, research. And actually, thank you to the audience, because I think we've got some really interesting um, ideas to follow up further on. Um, and I think some of that we can do uh, with this data. I think it's just such an important set of issues, which is part of the um, public policy debate and which we've seen actually discussed over the last couple of days in terms of thinking about the role of uh, paying for social care in, um, in intergenerational uh, redistribution. Um, so uh, as I say to everyone listening, um, please do think about signing up to our event um, on the 23rd um, and look out for more to come from David, Peter and co-authors um, on this project, which is one of the among all the very exciting things we've got going on at IFS, this is certainly among the most um, exciting. So thank you, David. Thank you, Peter. And thank you especially to everyone who's been watching.